All right. Well, while we're sitting here grooving to uh, Chaka Khan, tell me something good. You know what time it is. It's that time in the afternoon when I get to bring on friends who are doing great things and they get the opportunity to tell me something good. And I was fortunate to meet uh, the gentleman that's sharing the screen with me when my son was playing football out in Weston. And I know him to be a great entrepreneur, a great family man, a just all around amazing guy. Quincy Faison, it's your chance to tell us something good, brother. Hey, well, listen, Steve, thanks for having me on. Um, well, here, here's my good is not all this loss in 2020. Uh, we know that we're going through a pandemic and we've got two choices. Like you said, we either can put our hand in the sand or we can figure out how to grow it and, and change our lives, right? And so my tell me something good is really about uh, what I consider the period of time that we're entering right now is going to be the greatest transfer of wealth that we will see in our lifetime. And what does that mean? All right, when I say the transfer of wealth, think about the baby boomers who have been grooming their companies for 20 years, right? Great cash flow, stable cash flow. They're, with the pandemic, they're ready to move on to the next phase of their lives, and that's retirement. And so someone's got to pick up some of those great companies and be able to take it from where that awesome entrepreneur for 20 years built and take it to the next level. And so that's what we've been doing. We've not been sitting around. We've actually been looking at companies that fit that model. And um, we think that this is uh, an, an awesome growth opportunity, not just for ourselves and, and, and faith on capital, but it's also a growth opportunity for people that are sitting at home trying to figure out where they're going to put their money, right? Not real estate right now, right? So yes. how, how, do they, how are they going to grow in 2020? You know what's amazing? I've done, uh, you know, almost 100 of these shows. I've had great entrepreneurs. That's the first person who really, you're the first person who really put it in those kind of terms. And I love the fact because if you look back in history, there have been times when there have been a great transfer of wealth. And they've usually come from some unrest. And, That's you know, exactly they don't just ha happen. They just happen when there's confusion, when there's doubt, when there's fear. Warren Buffett says when people are fearful, you know, get greedy, baby. So uh, you're, you're I, exactly right. I, I love it. So for my audience, uh, please share like a little bit about who you are, what your career path is. I find it fascinating all the things that you've done and continue to do. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit, I think that'll be really telling. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as you know, I am a serial entrepreneur. I uh, started my career at the IBM Corporation. And like anybody else my age, and I'm, I'm 44, I'll be 44 tomorrow. But like anybody my age, when you come out of college, you want instant gratification, right? You don't want to work for 20 years to become a vice president. You want to be a vice president in year two. And uh, I had that same mentality uh, when I came out of school was I wanted to climb the IBM ladder as fast as I could. And I began to climb it, but it wasn't as fast as I wanted to go. And I started catching the entrepreneurial spirit while at IBM and uh, started my first company uh, reselling a product called SAP, which is a, an ERP business management application. Um, we did that for several years, had some great success, was able to exit that organization. And uh, we launched a company called Sculosity, where instead of being a reseller, uh, we are the software publisher. And we wrote code, uh, pretty big code, uh, a big application, but we wrote that primarily for wholesale distributors and manufacturers to run their entire business, be very affordable, and allow them to do exactly what we just talked about, allow them to start to grow their business, understand their financials, understand where there might be leaks in what they're doing. And so, over time, you know, we've got several hundred customers in that business. And what we found was that we were doing more business consulting in those two industries for our customers free of charge. We were installing software and they were showing them exactly what we see seen at 100 other manufacturers. And then they would adopt that. And then we would watch. They will take their business from $5 million to $10 million, right? And here we are getting our <laughs> – exactly. You know, and we're, we're making, we make good money uh, in that organization. But my thought was, if we are helping these guys, why don't we put a strategy together where we can actually uh, acquire some of our customers and acquire other manufacturers? And we launched Phase on Capital to do just that, right? We want to be a vehicle for small to mid-sized companies to exit the organization. 
Now, as you know, uh, the private equity world is a large world, right? They want 10 million, 20 million, 50 million. And a lot of times that small guy that's been running that business for 20 years, they're kind of an afterthought, right? There's not an easy exit for that type of business. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to provide that easy access, I'm sorry, that easy exit from those type of organizations that are, are solid. My, in my book that, that, um, that'll be coming out in the next 60 days, I talk about a concept called the walrus, right? No one's ever heard of the term walrus when it comes to uh, investing or things of that nature. We all have heard of a unicorn, right? That's that company that has a, a pre-IPO of $500 million and, and they haven't, they're still pre-revenue, right? But they got a $500 million valuation. And so everyone wants to chase that unicorn and everyone's forgetting about a walrus. And I consider that walrus that 20 year startup, that manufacturer who is sitting on the ice, they're fat and happy. They've got their kids in private school. They are driving nice cars. They have a great lifestyle for themselves, and they have no desire to take that business to the next level. And what people don't understand about a walrus is that when it's in the water, it can actually swim 22 miles an hour. And so what we do is we kind of give that walrus a kick into the water. We inject cash, we inject business processes, we inject technology, we inject all those things that the big manufacturers are utilizing to help take that walrus from that five million to that ten million to that twenty million is well roll up. So that's a little bit about. Uh, I love it. I, I think it's fascinating because of all the business categories I've been in, I've seen that roll up strategy work from the manufacturer where they decide sharp or you know they'll go back into the market and buy their dealers, put them all yep. together, roll them up, and so I've never seen it done by small to small or medium to medium, it's usually giant comes in, takes yeah. it over, they take the heart out of it and then it goes away. Doesn't sound like you guys are, are doing that because small businesses, while they are lifestyle, they are usually run with a lot of compassion and empathy, which is what makes them good at what they are. Doesn't sound like you're gonna you know, stripe them of uh, or strip them of all of their stuff it's just gonna give them some gasoline that, that's exactly right and that's their strategic value right typically the owner is the seller right so he has a relationship with who, all of his customers and we don't want to do that but we also want to give these guys a bigger capacity all right one of the industries we're rolling up right now is the cnc or cnc machinery industry and that's a very very fragmented industry there's not a lot of major players that, that own 30 or 40 percent of the market and so we would we want to have that uh, that local flair, but a central organization that gives them the ability to win bigger deals, give them the wow, ability to put a, put a sales team in place, put technology in place, and know that they're not by themselves. And, and we've done so far in that industry, we've done two acquisitions. And um, the, what the business owner told me was that I wanted to exit the business prior to you guys coming in because I found a new form of passion for my business because I'm not in this canoe alone. And as you know, as an entrepreneur, sometimes late at night, we feel like we're the only ones on the boat when we're trying to sometimes. build a business. Right? <laughs> Not that all the time. <laughs> exactly. And so when you, you have a whole team that's in the boat with you, you know, you feel like, hey, I want to stay. I want to keep a part, maybe 5% or 10% so I can be a part of something that I see that's going to be a lot bigger than I could take it. So, so I'm fascinated by this because I think everyone and, and being a small business, a serial entrepreneur myself, getting to work in lots of this, everybody wants to leave a legacy. And I think you're ensuring that their work goes on. You know, I think a lot of times these companies run into, okay, it's the fourth quarter. What do I do now? And yep. it either goes away. Family members don't want to get involved. You know, it's like, yep. what happens? I've built this whole thing. You give them that ability to say, hey, that company, I built that. I started it right. from scratch. So yep. I, I love, love, love the strategy and did not know that that's what you're doing. So th thanks yep. for sharing that. I want to switch gears for a second and go back to sort of the origin of your career. You played football and as yep. a sports guy and a family that's really into sports, I saw you 
building business, out on the field, coaching uh, kids, coaching your son. So I'm curious if you could share with the audience what yeah. football has taught you and how do you manage all of those buckets? Because you've always been a guy dedicated to your family, and I admire yeah. that more than anything. So if you can sort of speak to that football mindset, how it transfers to business and then family. Yep. Listen, football is, is business, right? You you think of, think about all the skills that you learn as as a player, as a coach. Some of those things are hard work, right? Teamwork, listening, understanding, taking instruction. All those things apply in the business world, right? So the first thing is teamwork. That's your team. That's your employees, your staff. That's your vendors, your suppliers, all those people that help you in business. The other one is a passion for whatever you're doing. Right. You remember on those Saturday mornings, those kids would show up at the fields and they had a passion to go beat PPO or they had a passion to go beat whoever they were playing. And that went from the coach down to the players. I had this saying when I was coaching out in Weston was you have to hate to lose more than you like to win. And that builds a burning desire of how you will shape everything that you do when you wake up every day. And if you have that burning desire and that fear of losing, then you're going to do everything you can not to lose. There's nothing different about business, right? This is, we all have competitors. We all have people that do the exact same thing that we do. And the way I look at it is that my competitor is taking food off of my family's table. And so when I wake up, what am I going to do to make sure that my family eats? Right. And, And that, think about it, that whole analogy of everything about football kind of bleeds over. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, always being family and being at the park and, and being around the kids. One of the things that I wanted to be very clear when I got into the entrepreneur spirit, and I got into this as an entrepreneur when my oldest son was maybe six months old, right? I left a nice cushy job at IBM with a six-year-old baby. I mean, six-month-old baby. And um, I always told myself I did not want to be one of those guys that was always on the plane. I didn't want to be living out of a hotel and talking to my kids over the phone and my wife telling me everything that they did. And so I made it a point that during the season, I would not travel. I would focus my energy. Sometimes I leave the office at three o'clock. I'm I'm writing plays because they can't get that time back. They will never, ever be able to say dad was there or I don't want them to say dad wasn't there, right? So when, when I get older and older, we can talk about all those memories that we built for the first 16, 18 years of their lives. And that's always been really, really, really important to me because when I was growing up, my father was at every single sporting event and he was a coach, right? And, and I remember that and it stuck with me, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. As a guy that witnessed it every Saturday, I wasn't – capable of coaching football and never played. I didn't really have the understanding. I coached the basketball side of stuff. But when I would go out to the games, I too never missed a game, was always there for them, always supportive. It became social. It became important. But to this day, those guys, my sons, remember the time I invested in them. And I think, you know, and I'll switch gears again here and take that concept to Maybe the pandemic was a gigantic slap in the head to some people who were traveling all over the place, who didn't have family dinners and didn't do all of that. And maybe this is just a reorganization of priorities to say, hey, listen, family is it. Family first. And then, you know, so speak to what the pandemic has taught you. What are your takeaways you know, a lot of we started the, the the show with, hey, a lot of people ran away and hid during this. And it ain't yeah, getting yeah. different, man. This is new. This is a new new. So speak to that, if you would, from a business mindset and a family mindset. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to it primarily from, from a family standpoint, because I really do think that this pandemic was a reset. It, it, allowed, it. it allowed all of us to slow down our lives. Right, because you know, we, you run a mile a minute, and even though you think you're doing some things right, you might be doing a few things wrong, and you're moving so fast, you never identify those things that you were doing wrong. And so, being able to, my wife is at home working from home, my uh, oldest sons are, or my both of my kids are working from home, and I can just walk out of the office and have a conversation, or 
I'm not driving to three practices. You know, at six o'clock, we can go outside and actually throw the ball. You know, at seven o'clock, we can sit down and have dinner, right? And, and, and talk about what was your day like? How, what did you experience? What happened in virtual school? And those things are, are really, really good for me. And then from a, from a business perspective, it also allowed me to clear my head, clear my head to figure out what strategies do we want to take the companies that we own and to get to that next level, right? What is, where are we taking Shilosity, right? What is the focus on phase on capital? What are we doing in the UK with my partner internationally? And so I've got a lot of, I got a lot of time after five o'clock to do a lot of, a lot of that thinking. And so I'm now able to handle everything, family first, the business, and then more importantly, the people that work for us, right? Because it, it. they have families, they have everything that we're talking about right now. L- love it. So I, I knew you'd be a great guest. I've always <laughs> admired you, your stature, how you hold yourself. Um, it, who do you want in the audience to reach out to you? So, you know, thankfully we've created an audience and a following for this. Tell me something good. Who do you want to reach out to you? Who's a good prospect and how do they find you? Yeah. So I've always been a believer in business about giving. All right. And so I kind of flip that, right? If anybody's listening to this and, and they think they can leverage me, you know, they can get in touch with you, Steve, and, and they can, you know, we can have a virtual cup of coffee and then we can talk about how I can help them. Uh, from, from my perspective, I'm really focused on two key areas, right? Our software business and finding more manufacturer and distribution distributors. And then I'm also looking for folks that want a piece of that wealth transfer, right? They, maybe they don't want to invest in real estate or, or apartment complexes. You know, I, I do think that what we're doing on the manufacturer side and that walrus that I like to consider a, a new asset class, you know, we want to talk to those people that might want to invest in some of those private equity firms that have dry powder and are looking for a firm like Phase on Capital that can help give them some return on some money that they've got sitting on the sidelines right now. Absolutely love it. I, uh, I want you to use me as a resource I'm going to stay tuned. When is the book uh, ready for, uh, when do you think that'll be out? Yeah, so we're, we're trying for November. And I mean, you've written a couple of books, so you know how that goes, right? <laughs> you try for one thing and you've got to move on. So I'm really, I'm really focused on trying and getting out before the new year, to be honest. If we can do um, that around, around the uh, Christmas holiday, I think we'll be in good shape. I can't wait to read it. I can't wait. When you do it, I'll have you back on the show. You were everything... Um, I thought you'd be, um, and I am thrilled that we are friends, and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Well, thanks for having me on, Steve. I really appreciate it. You'd be good, brother. See you. See you.